here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. In this episode, we focus on two very innovative coronavirus-themed ETFs that launched recently. And uh, we are all waiting for a breakthrough that will allow a return to normality. And in fact, there have been some very encouraging developments in this global race to develop coronavirus vaccines and treatments. And there's a lot of investor interest in companies that are working on finding a cure for this virus and also in these new ETFs. And uh, picking a virus winner is not easy because uh, not all of these vaccines and treatments will be successful. In fact, very few of them will be successful. So ETFs that provide a diversified exposure to many promising companies is much better. We'll first look at the ETF MG Treatments, Testing and Advancements ETF, ticker symbol GERM, which as the name suggests, holds companies that are developing testing vaccines or uh, treatments for this virus. And then we'll talk about the PACER BioThreat ETF, ticker symbol Virus, V-I-R-S, uh, that not only focuses on companies which are involved in the development of vaccines and treatments, but it takes a broader approach to structural trends that are emerging as a result of this pandemic. Uh, so, for example, it uh, also holds companies that enable uh, work from home trends. So let's dig deeper into these ETFs, what they are designed to do and what's inside them. Joining me now are Sam Masucci, CEO of ETF Managers Group, and Dr. Reynold Benetieri, Professor of Medicines at Rutgers University. Sam and Ray, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you very much for having us, Nina. Yes, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So we are talking about the ETF MG Treatments, Testing and Advancements ETF, very interesting ticker symbol, GERM. And uh, it made its debut just about a month back and the performance has been really impressive. So to start off, tell us what is GERM and what do investors need to know about it? Sure, Nina. Uh, this is Sam Masucci. I'm happy to, uh, to answer that question. Um, ETF Managers Group has made a name for itself in the uh, exchange traded fund market by launching important themed ETFs. And our most recent uh, launch of the ETF MG Treatments Testing and Advancements, ticker symbol GERM, is to really address a lot of investor interest in getting a portfolio access to the companies that are most important in the areas of vaccines, treatments, and testing um, within the medical space. And, and a lot of that is being driven by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and so we worked with prime indexes to develop a fund that give people a portfolio solution with access to this most important uh, investment theme. Very interesting. Now, we all know that a return to normality is possible only with a very effective vaccine to fight this virus, but uh, that would probably happen sometime in early 2021. Uh, and a vaccine would really allow people to live, work, travel, socialize, do everything safely again. Uh, but for the near term, it is very important to have a robust testing and tracing system to contain this virus. But coronavirus testing is still a big problem in the US, uh, particularly in states uh, 
in the south and west which are wit witnessing a big surge. Uh, we hear about people waiting in their cars uh, for 14, 15 hours in Arizona to get tested and then for days to get the results. So that makes contact tracing somewhat useless. Uh, so please tell us why testing is such a big problem in the US. So COVID-19 has generated a crisis uh, that is really unparalleled in the characterization of infected individuals. Uh, and why is that the case? Two predominant reasons. The virus lives in the upper airways. That's the back of the throat, the nose, and uh, even above the vocal cords for a significant period of time before causing any symptoms. So many people become infected and transmit the virus and don't even know they're infected. Uh, and we didn't know this uh, until the last four months, really. Uh, we've now recognized asymptomatic transmission occurs and that requires us to rapidly test virtually everyone in the US um, who has exposure so that we can, as you alluded to, contact trace. Well, when you're talking about 300 million people and rolling out the logistics of having a test with a turnaround time, either at point of care in the doctor's office immediately, or after four, six or eight hours, it becomes a, a logistics nightmare. So diagnostics are incredibly important and not only do they have to be accurate, but they have to, the turnaround has to be incredibly fast, faster than most other diagnostics that we currently have available in other disease states. Okay, so tell us uh, a little bit about uh, some of the latest developments uh, which have been done on testing front. And uh, I see some companies in your ETF uh, that I know are working on uh, coronavirus testing, uh, Quest Diagnostics, uh, Quiddle Laboratory Corp. Uh, so could you please tell us about the latest developments in, uh, on this front? So many of these companies have adopted uh, traditional um, polymerase chain reaction testing of uh, body fluids. This is either with a Q-tip in the back of the throat or nose that then is examined for the presence of molecules that detect the virus. Um, but other tests, the Cepheid company for one uh, example, has a very rapid test that can be done in about four hours. That's called a point of care test. And so that means the individual comes in to a provider's office, gets the test and can wait for the result. Um, so that offers advantages. The other real innovation that has occurred is the demonstration that you can collect saliva and the virus can be detected even when shipped uh, from a, uh, a uh, individual's home to a central laboratory. Now, many of the other large companies you've described, Quest, uh, LabCorp, have adopted some of these uh, testings. Uh, so, you know, the the real game changer will be the quick turnaround, not only of the diagnostic, do you have virus, yes, no, but also antibodies that could suggest that the patient has immunity. We've yet to refine that, but many companies, including the ones mentioned, uh, are doing a tremendous amount of work in this space. I'm optimistic by early fall that we'll, we, we will have a uh, antibody test that could show potentially immunity to COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Very interesting. Now, on the vaccine front, uh, too, we have seen some very encouraging developments. Uh, for example, Moderna stock is surging today uh, because they reported the results from their trial. Novavax uh, stock surged last week, and both these are holdings in your ETF. So before we talk about uh, developments 
and vaccines. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Sam, about uh, the reaction from investors, early reaction uh, to this EDF, because the performance, as I mentioned, has been quite impressive, uh, even the short period uh, since it uh, made its uh, debut. Sure. Well, the, the, uh, you know, the simple answer is it has been extremely well received by investors. The fund was launched uh, you know, a little more than a month ago, and it has um, just under 40 million under management, which is very fast growth for a, a new ETF, which was launched with just two and a half million dollars back in uh, mid-June. Um, we can also look at the types of investors that are showing a lot of interest. It's had significant daily volume. Um, it's traded over 83 million shares um, since its inception. Um, early this morning, it was already up 2.7 million. But then also when you look at some of the types of investor platforms, like for instance, Robinhood. Robinhood has almost 4,000 separate accounts holding germ. So what that tells us is not only is the ETF of interest, and Robinhood is very much oriented towards younger investors, um, it's, it's, so the fund has interest by a number of younger investors, and but they're also jumping onto it very quickly, which indicates pent up demand for accessing this important theme because it's on the top of everyone's minds now. Um, what will the impact of uh, the coronavirus be? Um, what is the, obviously the, uh, the best way to get access to a broad group of companies that are helping to um, eradicate this either or, or, or treat and, and test it. And so we built this portfolio of 56 companies that best represents that. And so, you know, I, I mean, I've been doing this a long time now, and I believe this is my 26th ETF that I've launched in my career. And this is one of the fastest uh, growing ETFs that I've had the experience in, in helping to build and launch. Very interesting. Obviously, there's a lot of investor interest in these companies and uh, in the EDF too. Uh, so, particularly about vaccines, because vaccines would allow return to normal, and we all want to return to normalcy. So, Dr. Ray, could you tell us about the work being done by uh, some major uh, biotech companies uh, uh, on coronavirus vaccines? Yes. Uh, you know, Nita, the vaccine. Uh, to COVID-19 is really going to be our lifesaver. It is really going to be the platform to get us back to normalcy. What we know is that good hygiene, masks, and social distancing have, affected, have been very effective in diminishing the spread in some but not all states. So think of the vaccine as a way of really inducing an immunity such that the virus can't reach susceptible individuals. And uh, the vaccine trials that are, that are ongoing right now is in part, interestingly, a industry, uh, academic, and federal collaboration. Uh, many of the trials are being underwritten by NIH, uh, with Big Pharma. And the way this is being approached is really quite unique because the platforms for large clinical trials currently exist within NIH networks. So Big Pharma is leveraging those networks to engage uh, individuals in vaccine programs. So the concept of doing a trial of 25,000 individuals swiftly across the US can be accomplished by pooling the assets of NIH as well as Big Pharma. This is really exciting. This has not happened before. You have to go back to the influenza uh, pandemic uh, uh, before you can really get to a very similar circumstance. So. Uh, I'm excited by the partnership. The partnership will assure that this, uh, these trials will be done with high fidelity, quickly, and in areas of increased infectivity. Think about it. The way you prove a vaccine works is you have to target those patients who are being affected. So there needs to be what's called a readiness cohort. These are cohorts of participants across the country that can be mobilized swiftly 
depending on uh, what's occurring almost in that month uh, to vaccinate people and then look at outcomes at 28 and 60 days. So what uh, I am reading is that these vaccines are likely to become for, you know, wide consumption only in early 2021. Why such a long wait? And uh, do you think something may become available by the end of this year, maybe? Well, I can tell you that uh, most of the big pharma that is developing these vaccine trials are ahead of schedule. I think people want to be realistic and they don't want to give false uh, hope. But we are seeing in, in the case of several of the big companies that Germ uh, has in their portfolio are a couple months ahead of where they thought they were going to be. Now, why does it take so long? Well, if you can imagine enrolling tens of thousands of patients in trials, and these are placebo versus active treatment, doing it with high fidelity and recognize that your readout from the time you start the trial is going to take about 30 days, you suddenly uh, are, are pretty much running up against 2021. Um, you know, just culling all that data, presenting the data, looking for st uh, st statistical significance takes time. I would suggest, though, that in this case, uh, trials for vaccine usually take two years. Um, we're talking about maybe eight months. So this is on a fast track. Okay, makes sense. So let's hope a vaccine or maybe many vaccines become available and we return to a normal world. So Sam, my question is, will this ETF stay relevant then too? Is it designed to be a short-term investment till we get over this crisis or a longer-term holding? And uh, could you also talk a bit about the expected growth in global uh, vaccines market? Well, I can certainly speak to the, the longevity we would expect of the fund. Um, I can also speak to some of the companies we have that are non-US. Um, but now this is designed to be a long-term play. When you look at the frequency and diversity of disease outbreaks similar to COVID-19, they've continued to grow steadily since the past 30 years. Uh, I know that from January 2011 to January 2018, there were 38 epidemic events in the US alone. And there are over currently 20 combined pandemics and epidemics affecting the world today. So, um, you know, we see this and the science behind it and the companies leading that science as a, a long term investor play um, um, for US investors in, in germ. Um, as far as um, I think you're asking me of some of the foreign companies, so 16% of the fund is made up of um, non US companies. Um, these are companies like uh, Sanofi, uh, BioNTech, um, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, um, and we will continue because this is an index now that we benchmark that's rebalanced once a quarter, that as there are new entrants into the space, we will continue to pick up those as they meet the requirements for the index and we rebalance once a quarter. So we really do see this as a global play. I see. Very interesting. So while a vaccine is still some time away, uh, I understand that a treatment uh, may become available sooner. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the existing drugs for treating malaria, HIV, arthritis, Ebola, etc., were examined and are being examined whether they can be repurposed to treat this disease. And in fact, Gilead Sciences Remdesivir is already being used uh, in coronavirus uh, patients. And then there are many firms that are working on entirely new drugs targeting this disease. Uh, so Dr. Ray, could you please tell us about the current state on treatments for this disease and uh, work done by some major players? I think uh, you've hit some of the high points, some of the successes that we've recently had. Uh, the resdizavir is, is a drug that has been shown to be somewhat effective. Uh, I think our focus though, has been uh, a little bit myopic um, and short-sighted. We were looking, obviously, to treat the 
worst of the worst patients. Um, and, and certainly that's meritorious. But I think there's another opportunity that many of the uh, funds that uh, is incorporated in GERM are looking at early intervention, interventions to decrease the replication of the virus, maybe even in asymptomatic patients. Now, if you do that, you not only stop the transmission, but you stop progression. So I think we need to start refocusing not only in the ICU patients, the most severe of the severe patients with respiratory failure and acute lung injury, but also in the asymptomatic patient who is, uh, has virus replicating, transmitting, and may progress. So this is a fundamental change in direction and therapeutics. I completely agree that a single drug is not likely to be long-term effective uh, for COVID-19. And we must start to think about combination medications. And certainly in HIV, we know of three drug therapies uh, that are far greater, uh, far, far more effective than either dual or single therapies. It wasn't until we got to triple therapy that we really impacted remarkably. And I think that is some of the considerations that are, are, that are being uh, addressed now. A recent drug, uh, dexamethasone or oral steroids, was proven to be successful. That drug is, uh, is relatively inexpensive, but it's um, only been shown to be effective in the most severe of the cases, those patients in the ICU. So we are making progress. Uh, there's a clear path forward using, as you mentioned, Ebola or HIV. The repurposing of triple therapy may be really going to uh, change uh, our approach and therapeutic approaches. So I'm optimistic that for those patients who get early disease, we may be able to intervene to prevent replication and progression. Very encouraging, and I'm also very optimistic that we will have treatments and also vaccines for this disease very soon because some of the brightest minds in the world, the best companies, most biotech companies are working on it. Anything else investors need to know about this CTF? What I would say is it is the first and it still is the only ETF giving people targeted access to this important theme. It has tremendous volume. In fact, I'm looking, I think we may have a record volume day today with uh, over a quarter million shares traded. And uh, for those investors that uh, really aren't looking to do individual company research but want a perfected portfolio solution, Germ is really the best answer for that. Excellent. Congratulations on the successful launch. Thank and you. thanks so much to both of you for joining us today. Very good. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Joining me now is Sean O'Hara, president of Pacer ETFs. And we are talking about the Pacer BioThreat ETF, Tika Symbol, very interesting virus, VIRS. This launched just about 15 days back, and it's already up about 8%. Very impressive performance. Sean, welcome back on the show. Well, thank you, Nina, for having me again. Nice to be with you. So let's talk about the CTF. Uh, it is basically focused on companies that are combating biologic biological threats to human health. Uh, tell us about this ETF and uh, why you decided to launch this ETF. Sure. We, we actually saw this idea a, a, a couple of years ago. We have been sort of friendly with a biotech firm in New York who uh, does a lot of work in the biotech space. And they, they have a couple of other biotech-specific ETFs. And they developed this index that was meant to be sort of a comprehensive uh, approach to uh, the pandemic threats. And we didn't license at the time. Um, when this uh, virus hit, it sort of uh, reminded us it was out there and we started to talk to them again about it. And, um, and we just thought it was timely. Um, the, the ETF itself um, is not specifically focused on uh, the uh, health issues, you know, therapeutics or treatments or vaccines. Uh, that is a component part of the overall strategy. 
Um, but uh, their premise, and, and we sort of go along with them on this, is that, that these pandemics are coming uh, more and more frequently. And they're having a lasting effect beyond just the race for, in this particular case, a vaccine. Um, we were pleased to hear this morning, for example, that Moderna is sort of at the front of the list now, and they sort of move in and out, and we do own Moderna. Um, but we think there are other structural long-term trends that will uh, uh, that are emerging as a result. So uh, when you think about the ETF, obviously somebody should think about the things that are obvious, which is you know treatment protocol and uh, vaccines. You know how can we minimize the impact to health? How can we treat people so they get uh, well quicker? And, and ultimately, can we develop a, pack, a vaccine? But when you think about the other long-term trends, you know, I make this joke today that we're sort of all germophobic binge-watching hoarders and preppers today. Um, there, there are going to be lasting effects in terms of how we interact with each other in our public office spaces, in our public spaces, uh, in you know, big gathering areas. It's going to have an impact on restaurants going forward because eventually we're going to go beyond 25 and 50 percent capacity or just outdoor dining. And so we focus on, for example, food and water safety as an issue. We focus on social distancing issues like you know, stay at home, work at home, the, the revolutionary changes that are taking place with regard to people's ability to do their job uh, by not having actually to be in an office. Uh, we're looking at, you know, uh, detection and testing. We sort of got caught flat-footed there uh, across the globe. Uh, and so we suspect that we'll continue to see uh, a buildup in, in that going forward. Um, I'll just give you like one example of something that would not typically be in a biotech uh, story that would be, you know, dealing with a biological threat or a virus threat. Um, we just recently opened up our office here. And so, you know, we have protocols in place now that we didn't before we opened. Now, we don't have a lot of employees. We've got 45 or so people that come to our office here. Um, so we can actually physically have somebody uh, that can take everybody's temperature at the door. But if imagine if we were uh, located in a, you know, a 60-story high rise, it would be literally impossible for one person to do that. So that's the detection piece of it. And there's a name in the portfolio, and I own it personally, just for full disclosure. I like the name personally. It's in my own personal account. But it's FLIR Technologies, and they uh, manufacture thermal imaging cameras. Uh, their core business had been specifically military use, but they have a kind of a commercial use operation that they can put these cameras in places, and it can detect uh, you know, a, a person's temperature as they're walking past the camera. Uh, and so we start when we start to think about the due diligence going to be required to open up the economy again and to get people comfortable, these kinds of developments are going to be long lasting. It did not take us long uh, to get comfortable walking through a metal detector and having our bags screened after 9-11. Um, you know, it was a tragic one day event and then it was over. But the long lasting effect of that was it, it had an impact on the way we move around and we interact with each other. And so we're taking a bigger view of the pandemic threat uh, beyond just trying to be in the right place to find the right name that gets, you know, the sequencing right that can ultimately develop a vaccine. Very interesting. So as you mentioned, uh, this ETF takes a broader uh, approach uh, to trends that are emerging as a result of this pandemic. So it focuses not only on companies that are involved in the development of vaccines and treatment, uh, but also, for example, companies that are involved in the technologies uh, that enable technologies to benefit work from home uh, and stay at home trends. So when I look at the holdings, NVIDIA, which is one of the best performing stocks this year, Amazon, again, one of the biggest uh, gainer in market cap this year, Netflix, Walmart, Home Depot, and then Abbott, uh, Thermo Fisher. These are the top holdings in this ETF. Could you please tell us how holdings are selected and weighted in the index? Yeah, so the index provider who is LifeSci in this particular case identifies these themes, you know, research of current and future pandemics, uh, combat agents, a biological threat, 
uh, secure national borders, aid in stockpiling, improve food and water safety and purity, and enable uh, technology to benefit uh, work and home. And then they're selecting what they, they, they've deemed to be the leader. So as you go through, like, for example, NVIDIA, that's the streaming name, right? That's the, the technology, the backbone of the Internet that makes that makes streaming and working at home and, and Zoom and all that stuff possible. Amazon is, you know, there's been a seismic shift. E-commerce was a big deal before this, but uh, it's accelerating now as we are all not wanting to, uh, you know, be out in public so much. And I think these habits will be longer la lasting. Netflix is, you know, the home entertainment play. I'm not sure, uh, you know, when people will be comfortable going back to uh, a crowded theater, you know, it used to be the old joke, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Well, I'm not sure a lot of people are going to want to sit in a crowded theater. Uh, Walmart and Home Depot are stockpiling names. You know, Thermo Fisher's in the portfolio. They're a detection name. Abbott is obviously a drug maker. Johnson & Johnson's is a drug maker. And so they're trying to find the market leaders in all of these areas uh, attached to these bigger trends. And one of those trends is obviously trying to find the pharmaceutical or biotech solution, whether it's a therapeutic or treatment or a vaccine. But again, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a bigger, more comprehensive view. Um, there are going to be permanent changes. And so we think this is a long-term thematic investment strategy that's not over whenever or if we ever do find a vaccine for this one. Um, because the because of the societal changes that are going along with this, and we're pretty convinced that um, you know this is the sixth pandemic in the last 12 or 14 years, and we're pretty convinced that we're going to have more. You know, there's already reports out of China that there's a new swine flu uh, problem, and they have uh, an issue up in their northern province in China with regard to bubonic plague. And so, because we have so much freedom to move around the world. Um, these things can travel fairly quickly and get out of hand. And so that's why we've seen a sort of an uptick in these pandemics. Um, and we're going to have to be more prepared uh, along a lot of different lines going into the future to deal with this je beyond just finding a pharma, a pharma or a biotech solution or somebody who can develop an effective treatment or a vaccine. Very interesting. Uh, so you had mentioned one of the companies that you like uh, in the ETF player system. Is that the ticker symbol FLIR? And, yes. Uh, uh, I see it is up uh, more than 5% today. Uh, would you want to talk about any other top holdings in the CTF that you like? Well, yeah. I mean, you look at a name like Ecolab or Quest Diagnostics, they, they fit the you know different parts of the themes. Um, when you think about, um, you know, J and J or Santa Fe or the, you know, the the pharma names in here or Moderna or Gilead who are in there, you know, those are the obvious names. But, but when you think about what's happened, you know, with regard to stockpiling, you know, there's uh, names like Clorox and uh, Hormel in the portfolio, you know, because the the grocery store shelves got sort of wiped bare uh, when you know this first started. So. There's a sort of a whole uh, constituency of uh, of names here that are kind of interesting when you think about them. So this CTF, of course, the name suggests that uh, it's uh, designed to capitalize on this uh, pandemic. Uh, so is this designed to be a short-term investment uh, in the portfolio till we get over this crisis, or it is uh, designed to be a longer term holding in the portfolios, uh, which are uh, and designed to be, you know, designed to benefit from longer term trends that are emerging as a result of this pandemic. I think it's a long term play because I don't think this is the last of the pandemics, and I think that there's going to be lasting uh, societal changes as a result of what we're what we're experiencing here. Whether again, it's work at home, stay at home. Whether it's uh, the more, more aggressive cleaning and sanitation, you, you have to think about um, the the way this has hit us. Uh, in order for businesses to reopen, people are going to have to feel safe going back to those places. I guess the ultimate form of safety would be if we had a vaccine. Um, but short of that happening, there are there are measures that are going to be put in place at all these businesses that are not in place today or that will become uh, a more aggressive approach to to some of these issues. Um, and so we think it's a longer term uh, play. It, you know, going back to FLIR as an example, uh, you, know, you know, if we're going to go back to see a live baseball game or sporting event where 65,000 people are going to be, 
then the operator of that stadium, or we're going to go to a concert venue, the operator of that venue uh, has an increased responsibility now to make sure that they're doing everything they can to make sure people are safe and feel safe. Um, and so the way we do those things is going to change permanently. Uh, you know, we're still going through metal detectors now 19 years after 9-11. Um, and we're still having our bags screened at buildings. Um, you know, we're, we're standing in these machines with our arms above our heads at airports before we can go on planes. We're still limited in the number of items we can take and how much we can take. So th those were reactions to an event that turned into long-term trends. And we view this as the same exact thing. Obvious uh, as a part of the strategy is let's find a therapeutic or a protocol or a vaccine. But beyond that, these are big long-term uh, permanent changes to the way we think society works and they can be invested in uh, for growth over time. Very nice. Congratulations on the launch and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Please visit the ETF section of Zax.com to learn more about these ETFs and many other interesting ETFs. Make sure to be on the lookout for the next edition of ETF Spotlight and also make sure to subscribe. If you have any comments or questions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.